the recording. Um, so it's been a while since the last one. Um, so thank you guys so much for being patient with me as I was trying to, you know, gener like figure out what kind of material I want to do. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, I don't really have, like we've heard so much about uh, COVID-19 and I was like, no one really wants to hear about like how the virus is transmitted. But then this amazing conversation happened yesterday with the Harvard Orchestra during Ray's masterclass. So then what I did was I threw out the entire idea for my mole cast and I completely worked on this. <laughs> yes, mole cast is like a podcast. Um, so I threw out my entire plan and I decided that the mole cast for today was, is going to be this. So how does classical music survive a global pandem a pandemic? Um, <laughs> oh, really? Let, uh, I'll ping Annie. Annie will, Annie will extend it. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yes, I have to, yes, you did create the, create the mole cat's heart. Oh, uh, thank you, Ray. All right. So, um, so before I launch into what the podcast is um, all about, um, let me make uh, just a few quick notes here. So one, I'm seeing a couple people that are saying, I'm busy, I wanna listen, how can I listen to this? Um, no problem. I'm trying out recording this, so we'll see how the quality is. Um, the recording, oh my gosh, I cannot look at chat. Stop with your eyebrows. Um, so, uh, we'll see how the quality is, um, the, uh, recording and all future, uh, announcements of the podcast will be on the science server. Um, if you don't know, we do have a spinoff server from the main Ray Chen violin server. So we don't completely inundate with math science, even though we do all love it so much. Um, if you're interested um, just let us know. Actually, maybe Justina, wherever you are, um, can drop a link in self-promo links so you guys can join. We accept scientists, aspiring scientists, people who just vibe with science. Um, you're all welcome to join. Um, so, and all of the article links that I'm going to be using will also be in that server. So as always, as we are good scientists, we should cite our sources. Oh, thank you, Justina. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, uh, the next point. Um, if So I have a couple ideas that I'm working on for the next episode, um, but obviously I wanna hear from you guys. Um, if you have ideas that you wanna hear about, that you're interested in, um, you can either drop them in the science server, um, you can drop them here in the chat with hashtag episode, like that, um, or you can slide in my DMs um, and give me some ideas. May or may not read all of them, uh, depending on how inundated my, my phone, yeah, sh shush, yes. <laughs> Um, but it just helps me generate um, new ideas for content. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to almost four months of being in the Ray Chen Violin server and being in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we have gone through a lot. I mean, I just looked at the calendar like earlier today, yesterday, and I was like, holy cow, we're almost at, what? Oh, no, 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 Ray, this will totally happen here. I just don't know where the ideas can go. Yeah, 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 yeah. This will totally happen here because the nice part is, is you can, we can host Molecast. Yeah, I have a plug for your server later. You're, you're making me get off schedule. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> I cannot read and, and do this at the same time. I can do this, whew, I can do this. All right. Um, yes, there will be a plug for your content later because you are the host for the mole cast. Uh, so anyway, as I continue, we are now four months into the pandemic. Um, and now what we're starting to see is that major orchestras, uh, Indianapolis Symphony, Nashville Symphony, Royal Opera House, you name it, um, they're cutting all casual staff jobs. There's a big reduction in actual entertainment. 
Um, but, you know, what I can say is, is that the only group involved in classical music that's not looking at having their jobs cut is the basement gang because they work incredibly hard for a crisp high five. <laughs> um, so the live performances, unfortunately, are considered a perfect breeding ground for transmission. You have a lot of people crammed into a small space. Some of these spaces are beautiful. They're over, you know, 100 years old. I just looked up this morning. The Symphony Center here in Chicago is 116 years old. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, because these spaces are, you know, the perfect uh, viral breeding ground, there's only one other thing that's more viral than that, which is Ray Chen making a cringy joke in Maine General. <laughs> um, so what have we turned to now? We have turned to um, a variety of different sources, such as um, Zoom, which I promise I will not get into a rant about Zoom. I will hold back as much as possible. But we have used Zoom, we have used Discord, we have used a variety of different online and social media platforms to connect with classical music. But let's face it, it's not the same. It's not the same as walking into a concert hall and being immersed in the music, having the architecture shape the way that you listen to the music. Um, for me, being in community orchestra, being able to play with my friends um, and create that sound. I, I just looked at my calendar as uh, we're getting close to fall quarter here at the university, and I realized I was going to have to delete uh, rehearsals for Brahms Symphony Number no. 2 that my friend was going to conduct. And I was like, wow, you know, where have we come from? Um, and where are we going to go now, um, now that we're dealing with a pandemic? And how does classical music cope? So I, as all of you know, or most of you may know, I am not a um, musician. I am a PhD student. I study molecular biology. One of my projects is on COVID-19. We are looking at how um, some of the additional proteins that COVID-19 makes um, could be preventing uh, antiviral response um, or a response from our bodies. So you can imagine COVID-19 being like a Swiss army knife. It doesn't have one weapon it can use against you. It has many weapons it can use against you. Um, so, but you know, it's really interesting when I Googled after Ray was asked this question yesterday, you know, how does classical music really, you know, come back or manage during COVID-19, because let's face it, it's not going to be months, this could be years. Um, I then asked the question, you know, well, have there been any studies to examine the droplet formation, the aerosols that are produced from brass instruments, wind instruments, singers? Um, and surprisingly before COVID-19, there wasn't that many. So. This kind of moves us into our three part, the three questions that we're going to ask for today. Um, one, which is the science behind the quote unquote pandemic orchestra. And is this science that's currently out sound science? Um, so before, as everyone, the one thing I want everyone to leave here today is how to be a better consumer of science news. Um, number two, what does an orchestra look like now? Um, so I scoured through my Instagram account, um, looking at some of the current photos of people performing. Um, some, there's like one here in the US, most of them are overseas. Um, and then number three, which kind of made me chuckle because Ray described classical music as being in an ivory tower. And I was like, Shh. <laughs> science has the exact same problem. Um, so it's, Time for these two, uh, you know, polarizing, refuse to interact with other uh, communities to come together um, in order to solve these uh, problems. So, um, and I see Holly in the chat, just like, for real, I see you, I see you. <laughs> um, yes, we need to have some sort of fusion. So let's launch right into the science. So in May 2020, you might have seen me freak out a little bit in Maine general when I saw that Vienna Philharmonic performed a study 
um, where they fitted members with a device that sprayed mist into um, their, the musician's lungs and then examined how far the mist would travel while playing. Um, and what they found was the following, was that people who played string instruments had no difference between um, how much mist or aerosols that came from their nose or from their mouth um, between playing and resting. So, you know, whether you're performing, I don't know, Brahms Violin Concerto or just sitting listening to the conductor drone on about how the violas are out of tune, um, it was only 50 centimeters. There's only a 50 centimeter um, diameter of aerosol generation. So brass and woodwinds, you would think would p possibly violate the one, 1 1.5 meter, two meter social distancing rule. Oh, I'm gonna get to that, Ray. Hold that thought, I'm going to get to that. Um, so what they found was, is that more air was generated around their mouths. So the opening where you, you know, would blow in. And flute actually was the exception. They found that flute, you could generate aerosols up to 80 centimeters from the opening of the flute. Um, and really, when we think about this in a physics standpoint, um, this is really unsurprising. While air may enter an instrument quickly at the mouthpiece, it exits more slowly um, through the wider opening, mainly because of the way that the instruments are designed. There's usually a lot of tubing um, that the aerosols have to go through and you can lose a lot of particles that way. But hold that thought because as we continue on with the podcast, there's some new data that just came out 10 days ago that challenges this idea that Vienna Philharmonic is concluding that there may not really be a risk for musicians on stage. Um, so this study came out and as I was listening um, to the master class yesterday, yes, I did take notes that will immensely help my playing, but the science brain did get activated. My biggest question was, how, was this study peer reviewed? Peer review means that another independent group of scientists look at the study that you performed and they try to perform it for themselves. It's kind of the same as trying to find uh, equivalent in classical music would be, you know, other musicians trying to play, let's say, the Sibelius or, you know, the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. And if you have six out of seven violinists that say this concerto is impossible, like no one can play it, then we would say that there's, you know, a high reproducibility. But, you know, if you have one violinist, we'll just, we'll use Ray, who can say, look, I can play this, no problem. Um, then it makes you want to go back and, you know, try the study again, just to make sure that, you know, the study is sound and that you have all the controls, ignoring that. <laughs> um, so that's the first big question. As I scoured the internet as much as I could, there was only one magazine article that actually gave a detailed description of the study, and that was the Strad. Um, other articles that referenced this study did not have as much detail, um, which is a challenge because how can someone replicate this study and make sure that the results that you see are actually conclusive? Um, the other things, the other questions that I had <laughs> was what pieces did they play? Because there are some pieces, let's say, that I have played um, as an amateur that I really get into. And I'm going to go back to the Brahms as we just performed the Brahms in um, fall quarter. And it just really gets you fired up. Like you, you start playing, you're like, yeah, you know, I, you feel the fire of it, even though, you know, at that point I was, you know, first violin. And it's like, it doesn't matter. Like you're excited. And then the energy that you have will just go right into the soloist. Um, but during that piece, I get really animated and enthusiastic, and I can imagine the amount of, you know, the breathing that I'm doing is much different than like, I don't know, Buckaroo Holiday, like the second movement of the Rodeo, which is very calm, very chill, sleepy vibes. Um, the name is, <laughs> the name is escaping me right now and I'm really sorry um but that like there's definitely a contrast and I can imagine that 
You know, if you're a music student or a professional musician, you can imagine pieces right off the top of your head that your breathing is different, your engagement is different. Um, and you can imagine that more particles can be produced, um, aerosol particles can be produced during those pieces as compared to other ones. Um, the other questions that I have was how many pit players actually participated? And I referenced back to a comment that Ray made in the chat that Hank probably is breathing a lot harder than he does during uh, his practice sessions and performances. And that's something really important to consider is that we all play our instruments slightly differently. Like we all learn a similar way. Like you hold the violin like this, you hold the bow like this, you go like this. Um, I don't know why I'm doing motions and you guys can't see me. Um, but different players have different playing styles. And if you do not have a large enough sample size, we call this the N value in science then it makes your your conclusions very, very narrow. That it's, what? Oh, clarinet, darn you, you can't see me. Um, I thought for a minute you could see me and I was like, what? Um, so yeah, so our sample size, um, they did not mention a sample size in this study. Um, there, we don't know how many players that the Vienna Philharmonic tested. It could have tested one, they could have tested 10, but we, we don't know that. Sample size one, exactly. We just don't know. Um, the Strad doesn't mention how many players that they looked at. Um, and it really does put into question the uh, conclusions of their study. And if it's truly safe for uh, classical, uh, music classical orchestras classical musicians to be on stage um and the last point i have is the space that they played in so i mentioned earlier um that some spaces are beautiful they're historic we think carnegie hall symphony hall um you know just these beautiful architectural structures come to mind however some of these structures unfortunately are really old and i say this in a loving way as a boomer myself I'm 28, I'm going to be 29 here really soon. Um, you know, age, it, age is wonderful, but you know, it's also hard to retrofit some of these spaces um, with the proper, like, you know, air circulation and filters and stuff like that. Um, because, you know, we can imagine that in a space that does not get a lot of ventilation, aerosol particles will be generated and they will stay in the space, which makes it more dangerous for people to be not only watching the concert, but also playing in the concert. Um, so, and we want to keep all of these people safe. That's the primary goal besides getting classical music back up and online, um, that everybody can watch it in a safe space. Oh, bye, bye, Curry Egg. Um, so um, that kind of is where we are right now. And Vienna Philharmonic was not the only orchestra to do a study like this. Um, and the Berlin Phil, um, whose members we have seen many times in offstage uh, with Ray Chen live streams, had also did their own study. Um, and they released recommendations such as including the following, where strings would be spaced 1.5 meters apart. Um, drummers with a chair spacing of 1.5 meters would avoid sharing instruments and accessories. So you can imagine that, I guess, everybody has to bring their own timpani. <laughs> well, I can't, I have this like image of a timpani player just being like, oh yeah, no problem. Let me just roll my <laughs> poor timpani drops. Um, does ventilation move COVID-19 particles around and spread the virus? So yeah, if you, if you do not have the proper filters, the virus will in a closed space be generated from an infected individual and it will remain in the space. So you have to have a way of disseminating the virus out of the space or collecting the virus with something like a HEPA filter. Um, and a lot of spaces, newer spaces, um, have HEPA filters to prevent this spread from like air conditioners um, and stuff like that. But um, one of the things that I was thinking about, uh, so not HIPAA, it's HIPAA. Um, 
I pronunciation. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, one of the other things uh, when I was doing my research for this episode was right now the northern hemisphere um, is currently experiencing summer. Our friends in the southern hemisphere, Australia and Point South, are currently experiencing winter. So I wanted to ask the question, well, what are they doing? Because it's currently winter time down there. And as we all know, violins are very simple creatures. They require only two things, perfect humidity and perfect temperature. And neither of those things in Chicago in the wintertime actually exist. Um, so uh, the only thing that your violin only needs you. <laughs> So um, the only thing I could really find right now from the Australian websites that I looked at was that physical concerts may not happen until 2021, which would be summer for Australia. And overseas art uh, overseas soloists would have to wait until later to perform. Now, I didn't know if they were throwing like some light shade at you, like we're not going to let this Ray Chen guy come back into Australia until after this is all over, or if it was just in general. I just saw it and I was like, ooh, should probably let him know. Um, so I also saw Annie have a second question, but even if you filter out the virus, you're still moving the air. Doesn't that spread the virus too? Yes, it does. And, but the thing is, is that, and I will show in some of these images is that, oh my gosh, are you serious? You've been asked by Australian orchestras to go back and perform? Oh my gosh. Whoa. Whoa. That's, that's interesting. Oh, because you can get past the travel ban. Yeah, I was going to say, because like New Zealand's travel ban is like the best so far. They have managed... Australian passport, of course, of course, native, all citizens can return home. Um, but does, yeah. Um, so no, 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 we're going back to Annie's question. I just got, again, as we know, this is my second episode. We're practicing getting used to managing chat. Um, so Annie's question, yes, you can still move virus around in a closed space. But remember, you have, we should be wearing masks. We should be properly, we should be socially distancing and wearing masks so that already virus generation is greatly reduced. And by using it, so let's just imagine that one person would be 100% of virus. Wearing a mask, we'll say, is maybe like a 50% reduction. And these are very, very conservative numbers. And then having a HEPA filter in the space to collect any additional virus that's being generated will reduce that percentage to even less. And the thing about COVID-19 or any virus for that matter is it's not just about the exposure, it's about how much virus gets into you. Um, one of the things that is important in my experiments in the lab that I work with is we have to infect uh, cell culture, so cells that grow on a petri dish with virus every day or almost every other day. But it's about the amount of virus that we get, that we put on those cells, that shows the different types of immune responses that you have. So if you, let's say, put a lot of virus on a, on a cell culture plate, we call this a multiplicity of infection or an MOI. Um, you're going to have a very high immune response, but you'll also have a lot of cell death. Um, versus if you have, let's say, a very low amount of virus, um, you're going to see a smaller amount of immune response because you're obviously adding less virus to those cells, but those cells are going to um, uh, survive the virus infection. So, yeah, um, that's kind of what we are working with right now. So um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, there, and I, there are a lot, I see that the chat is now exploding with a lot of different questions. Um, there will be a question answer session at the end of the pod, of, of this talk, um, just so I can focus on what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but. Uh, again, if I don't get to your question, 
Um, no worries. You can always post it in the science server um, or you can just ask me when you see it in chat. Um, all right, so what do orchestras look like right now? You know, we're in the middle of COVID-19. We've seen orchestras in Asia and Europe get back to some semblance of normal. Um, so what I did was I just kind of perused um, the Violin Channel's Instagram page and um, also uh, the Dover Quartet, which if you ask me what my favorite quartet um, is, it's Dover Quartet. Sorry, I I'll fight you. Oh, thanks, Ray. Good luck with your Zoom sessions. No, 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 no. Don't don't worry. I have it recorded. So if you want to listen to it later, by all means, come listen to it later. All right. So um, let me go ahead and drop a couple of these photos into the um, chat right now. So we are practice rooms five and eight. Really, it's like the last. I love my phone. <laughs> How is it that I get one, four, nine, twelve, but not five through eight? Well, oh well, tried five. Let's see. Ha, got it. All right, so here's one. And some of these are really interesting. So this is um, uh, from Munich, uh, an orchestra in Munich. You guys probably know what the actual one is. Um, yep. <laughs> let's see and then oh wait boomer moment I can just do this from the app and then here's one that was really intriguing and I just had to include this in the podcast because this photo from Zipper Hall which is at Colburn um, is basically showing six foot distancing but a clarinet player that is literally surrounded in plexiglass and I was like, I, I just would love to ask him how the, how his sound has changed from like projecting to that projection just coming back into his face, like how he's had to change his playing style. Um, and I could just go on and on about that for forever. Um, and then let me just add two more. Annie's going to kill me. Um, this one is from the Dover Quartet, they are currently at Bravo Vale and they are playing to a socially distanced audience outside. And then the final one, this one has gotten, got me really mad. Um, and I'll tell you why. You'll see as soon as, as soon as I release it. Let's see. Oh shoot, I just sent two. Well, sorry. All right, so this is from the same organization um, in Virginia, Minnesota, and the one is in a church. The social distancing with this one makes me sad. Yeah, it's way too cramped. Um, there's a second photo where there's even more people stuck in like a two by four box, it looks like. Um, right, exactly, exactly. So, um, and the problem is, and this is where I get, I'm going to get a little spicy. And remember, here, on the, I am only saying my views, none of my views apply to Ray Chen or the Ray Chen violin server. It's, we are completely separate entities. I am just using his practice room. So social distancing means that you stay at least six feet apart at least is the key word and the issue with playing in a church is those benches each bench might be i would say 10 feet long so having multiple people sitting and in this photo there aren't many there's only one person per bench there's other photos where there are multiple people per bench um, and that's already a problem. The second thing is, is that this is an enclosed space. Um, I, they, these are stained glass windows. There's probably not that great of ventilation because it does look like a church. Um, but we're not going to assume. We will not assume. We all know, we all know what happens when we assume. Um, none of the players have masks on. Um, so there are a lot of questions with that particular photo. 
The same festival also performed outside, and you can see where they did uh, put up plexiglass um, with their brass section, which I thought was very interesting, the way that they used it. Um, the Dover Quartet actually, um, for their performance, like went into a stage, um, and they did observe social distancing with their audience. Um, I want to be kind and say that the people that are sitting closer together probably live together. Um, and you can imagine that if you live together as in a household, so like you and your, yes, Anna, I am currently recording at this moment. Um, you can imagine that if you are living with other people that you're like in one household. Um, so they can just count as one, I, being kind. The best examples though that I can see of proper social distancing is this orchestra in Germany and um, here at Zipper Hall at Colburn. Um, but even with um, the German orchestra, none of their members are wearing face or wearing masks. Um, and, but the one at Colburn, people are wearing masks. So probably if I had to like pick the best one, I would say the, the Colburn one, um, is probably like the best, like demonstration of social distancing. So I then asked like, okay, so what, what does an orchestra, like what are the policies that are in place for orchestras to get back to work in these regions? So here's what I got off of the Berlin Phil. <laughs> I don't know if it's just ironic or if it's just like a thing with this server, but if we have questions, we go to the Berlin Phil. That's fine. <laughs> um, so members are tested before going on stage, um, which means <laughs> that you need to have a qPCR machine and a scientist on site <laughs> and that made me smile laugh make me feel more secure about my job <laughs> so much <laughs> it's like oh what do you do I I am the scientist I'm the official scientist for the Berlin film <laughs> And I was just like, yes, I could totally do this job. And unfortunately, Ray left. So I can't like give him my resume and be like, hey, you know, can you give these <laughs> to your friends and say, I can be your QPCR, uh, literally molecular violin. <laughs> um, and that just made me chuckle. Um, the other thing is, is that a, P a QPCR machine can be, they're now smaller. The machine that we use is incredibly, <laughs> is incredibly heavy. It's like, um, oh, I'm trying to look at like a really good example. It's like probably taping like three or four toasters together, but it's much heavy. Like I, I'm a small person, but it requires like my boss and my lab manager to lift it and they are both six foot one like burly men and they they need that they they need two people to lift it <laughs> um and it's <laughs> it's remarkable um but i know there are machines that are smaller um that you could probably do a qpcr test on site um but like a qpcr test could take easy like people would have to show up at work to grab sample in the morning and no one could leave until the concert was over um because like a qpc like to do the rna extraction to run the actual pcr is going to take you like maybe three hours so like if you walked in at 8 a.m and then waited for your test results it would be yeah so like per sample so like if you had to do um, so no, 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 actually it's not per sample. So we can imagine like it would be for 96 people. So that's one like QPCR plate. Um, and you would want to have replicates. So if you got, let's say like three machines, you might be able to do like the entire orchestra in like, so if everybody walked in at 8am, you'd be done by lunch and you could tell people if they needed to go home or not, but that's still a really long time. Um, and we were actually talking about this in the lab the other day, um, that there are new tests coming out that are um, color change kit tests. So if you had the um, 
you know, the genome for COVID-19. They're trying to generate tests now that you could do at home and you could essentially put the um, primers, it would be like a one like step, you just throw it in a tube, you take a swab of your sample. And if it changed, if it was green, you could go to work. And if it was red, you could stay home. Um, these tests though are still under like incredible, like quality control and optimization. Um, and they're definitely not ready yet. It's just something that like a lab has been working on and they're really, really excited about within the uh, antiviral community. Um, but the, how expensive are these tests? So it depends on how you do your sample collection. The RNA extraction kits in the US that we use um, and the tests that we have um, to actually you know, test for COVID-19, they can be pretty expensive. Um, and that's why it was really crucial, especially here in the US, that tests would be covered fully by insurance companies um, because that would be easily a $200, $300 bill for you know, someone to get tested in order to go to work. Um, so that's just, yeah, it's, and th they really are, it's real. And, and that's just, and that's not even covering like the 200 to $300 like bill doesn't even cover the manpower. It probably covers like the majority of your supplies and that's just the insurance company billing you. That's not like the actual like manpower, the pipettes, the materials. Like I'm already thinking about Trizol because I have to buy some this week. <laughs> and it's like a thousand dollars i'm like oh no i'm gonna tell my boss i gotta buy it but it's fine like my boss is he knows like yeah it costs like a grand um so yeah it's only the it's only the material that we use um for actually gathering the rna from cells um that's not the so the rna extraction kit is even more expensive um, we don't use RNA extraction in our lab because we, if the scientific community has come together and has decided if you don't need RNA extraction kits, um, it's good to put those towards, um, you know, COVID-19 efforts. Um, scientists, it's not our money, it's the government's money. Um, we, the, when you pay taxes, that money go, some of that money goes into a pot and then that's issued out in grants and emergency funding like this. Um, but I'm digressing. So back to the Berlin Phil. Um, Berlin Phil also said that you should have 1.5 meters between string players, two meters between brass woodwinds and plexiglass players, um, and the piccolos go in the parking lot. <laughs> Um, the other thing is that it also has caused, um, a reduction of instrumentalists that can be on stage, which is bad news for everyone. Like you can't have your entire first violin section on stage. You can't have everybody on stage. Um, and, ev but it's bad news for everyone except the third violins. They're the first people in that orchestra to stand up and say, I will gladly sit out of this. <laughs> Um, so, um, and the other things, yeah, God, hey, represent third violins. <laughs> um, the other things that the Berlin Phil also said that they were going to do was that they were going to do a lot of deep cleaning, um, and that they were going to use e-ticket sales only. So that way they could do contact tracing on everyone who attended the concert and people who, and if they did have an outbreak, they could contact people um, so they could social distance properly. Um, so there are, there are really good initial steps that are in place, um, but there are, we don't have a lot of science to help, you know, really examine these questions. So, um, and this is where we come to the last question. And oh my gosh, I'm actually doing well on time. Yes. Um, so, um, this is where we talk about how science and classical music, two, like, ivory towers of, you know, just philosophy, I don't even know the word, um, they need to come together, um, 
in science, we always joke about how we live in an ivory tower and we ignore the problems of the day-to-day -day world because we're only concerned with examining this molecule or understanding, like, what are my cells doing? Um, classical music is the same way. I mean, we heard Ray say, you know, like, classical music lives in their own little bubble. They don't try to go out and connect with people. And I think that's what makes Ray so different. And that's what makes scientists who win Nobel Prize is so different. They actively get out and connect with the broader community to ask interesting questions and to provide interesting solutions. And I mean, look, we all know the stereotypical but incredibly valuable um, research that's been done with auditory neuroscience and neurobiology. Um, but now we're starting to see more fields in science branch into um, the questions that the classical music world is asking. So, um, and this is kind of where I told you to, you know, keep something like keep this idea of, you know, well, what do we currently know? Um, what we do know is that there are two studies, collaborative, co competitive, you decide. But five days ago, the University of Bristol in the UK, um, which has an amazing aerosol program in the Department of Chemistry, is going to study how singers generate aerosols and what is like the best way for singers to get back up onto the stage, um, which I thought was interesting. But then the beauty of Twitter and if I, and I know classical musicians love Instagram. I love Instagram. That's how I discovered Ray. That's where I put all my practice videos. I love Instagram. But if you need quick science, go to Twitter. Twitter is like how you can get like the most interesting random science in like 40 characters or less. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so um, and on Twitter, uh, an environmental scientist by the name of Shelley L. Miller at the University of Colorado Boulder is currently doing a study where she's examining um, th how instruments can produce aerosols and how these aerosols um, uh, could or could not uh, carry COVID-19. Um, and her twi Twitter handle I will drop in the chat. Oh no, I didn't mean to do that. Why did I do that? No. Oh uh, no, I didn't mean to click that. That was dumb. Oh, that was dumb. Oh well. Um, now I've got to scroll and here we go. Found it. So her Twitter handle, if you have Twitter, is Shelly L M Boulder. Let's see. This. Um, and you should definitely check this out. Um, so her, she has literally just started this study 10 days into it. So this is from July 14th. Today is the 19th. This is five days ago. So 10 days into this study, she has already, um, and she says right off the bat, these are exploratory. So we, again, as good scientists, as a good scientific community, we have to take this with a grain of salt because it hasn't been peer reviewed. It hasn't gone through the vetting process yet as a good scientific community would. But this is what she has so far. Instruments generating aerosols in the ranges of, si of sizes that can stay airborne for long periods of time indoors um, are, and are in the range of concern that can contain virus. So she's already seeing that instruments can produce these aerosols inside and that they're of the size that could potentially contain COVID-19. But what she's also found from the initial 10 days, and again, this requires extreme vetting and this study will probably not be ready for peer review until September. Um, mitigation measures that appear effective at reducing aerosol release are playing with masks that have slits for instruments. So you guys have kind of seen like the memes of like someone wearing a mask, but then there's like a sl like slit that they could like slurp a bubble tea or something. Um, bell covers, which basically is just multiple layers of nylon on the bells of brass instruments. And then general room air cleaning with a HEPA air purifier, which is also effective. Um, and the final interesting point that she found was that 
indoor rehearsals should be kept to less than 30 minutes to reduce risk of transmission. Um, so right now, this is not out on any preprint service, but she just started the study like 15 days ago. Um, so usually scientists do not tweet their results like that unless they felt that sure. That's like how interesting of a finding this is. And the scientific community right now has really come together because just like soloists and musicians can be kind of competitive, scientists can also be super competitive. Um, so um, having people tweet out the results, share the results in real time has been such a, ground, a groundbreaking achievement in science. Um, but to have a scientist come out like 15 days in her study to say, this is what we're finding so far, um, is also just, whoo, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like you just, uh, unless you felt that sure, because someone could come back to you later and say, hey, you were wrong. Um, because we know, like, we, we do it within the server all the time. Like someone says a really funny joke and then we, you know, come back and we're like, ha ha, you know, this is really funny. Um, so this is, yeah, exactly. Like the scientists who are in the chat are probably just like, I can't imagine my advisor doing that. Um, and like in science, you do not post your results that early unless you're that sure. Um, and that's why I wanted to make sure we, I brought this up to you today. Um, but, you know, as we're trying to generate so the data to guide classical music as to where we go, we now need more innovative solutions. And this is kind of where you as the community come into play. And you're probably sitting here listening to this thinking, oh my gosh, Mole, I'm 16, I'm 14, I'm 18, I've got a ton of stuff on my plate, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an official, what can I do? Or 31, exactly, like it doesn't matter what your age is. How, I know why you did that. Yeah, hopefully not 12. If you are 12, you need to yeet from the server. <laughs> this, is, this is the part where I tell you, you need to yeet. Um, so, and this is gonna, going to be a collaborative effort across the board. Um, you know, we need classical musicians to tell science what does and does not work. And we need science to also, you know, generate the focus on these questions that are plaguing classical music, because let's face it, we don't want the things that we really enjoy to disappear. Um, so uh, how can we protect musicians and concert goers? Um, you know, the biggest thing that I can tell you right now is testing. If we can find a way to, um, you know, test rapidly and test often, that would be one of the biggest ways that we could get people back into concert halls, back to work, um, if we had testing that was rapid and could be done daily. Um, the other, other points that, um, I've seen from other orchestras or ideas that I've had include, you know, we, my, um, I have a sibling, a younger sibling. Um, she is a nurse. Um, and one of the things that, um, while she's been working as a nurse, um, she had to face the mask shortage a couple months ago. And in lieu of not having a mask, the hospital gave her a face shield, which, yeah, it's not a mask, but it's better than nothing. Um, and, you know, trying to think outside the box, could a mask potentially help a flute player or a piccolo player who, you know, a flute or a piccolo, you, you know, you put your lips um, and you blow across the opening in order to produce sound. But that could help to mitigate the spread of um, generating aerosols. Um, the slits, she did not say exactly how effective they were. Um, again, using masks for all string players, that should just be a must in my opinion. Um, but because I don't play violin that long for that often, I'm sure it would get uncomfortable after a while. Um, but again, you know, reducing rehearsals and performances to 30 minutes or less could be better than nothing. Um, also, 
improving ventilation for concert spaces and understanding the flow of traffic. Um, so having designated entry and leave points if possible. Um, oh yeah, of course, um, is in incredibly important because you, what you don't want is you don't want people going in and out of the same door as much as possible. Um, if you could have people going in through only one or two doors and leave through only one or two doors, that can also help to mitigate the spread because you don't have people crossing paths um, and possibly touching. Um, actually, clarinet, that's a really, that actually was my next point, is sanitizing your reeds. Um, making sure that the reeds that you, like you use to the cups of water that you use to soak your reeds are completely covered to prevent any aerosols that are being generated in, in the air from being like, you know, fall, falling in. So that's another, that's a really good point, Blue. Hey, you know, Mole, if there's a fire, I'm not going through one door. I should be able to go through whatever door I want. Of course, if there's an emergency, any door that's available, just like there are, are emergency doors and doors that are designated for actual leave and entry, all doors would be, you know, fair game. Leave the building if it's on fire. Um, there's also, um, you know, the use of plexiglass. Now, I haven't heard from musicians yet as to how comfortable they are with plexiglass, um, if they're providing plexiglass or if it's like you know finally uh karma has come to all the flute players all the clarinet players are like oh look at my small adorable instrument and every cellist going grr <laughs> i was i was joking with my friend i was like well does that mean now you have to like carry your own like byop bring your own plexiglass <laughs> So, you know, if we're, if we're looking at, you know, silver linings, cello gang finally has their moment. You know, you want the, the flutes and the, and the oboes and the um, clarinets finally have to understand how much gear they need to carry. Um, the other points um, are, you know, um, and I, I say this not only for classical music, but also in general is to monitor cases and monitor performances. Um, society nowadays is very much a consumer of news and news quickly. However, this virus, although it infects quickly, um, we usually don't see symptoms until a week or two after the fact. I, as of this recording, really, really tried to find um, if there have been an increase of cases of COVID-19 after individuals attended a concert, um, I could not find any. That does not necessarily mean that there have been or haven't been any cases after people have attended performances. Um, I specifically also looked up the Virginia, Minnesota um, uh, performance, but I, again, I couldn't find any um, in time for this podcast. Um, but it's important to also, you know, consider that as we move forward, if you start to see outbreaks, um, how we need to, you know, appropriately scale back um, in order to maintain um, the spread of COVID-19. Because, you know, if we think about this, um, you know, in a long term forecast, because let's face it, this pandemic isn't a sprint. This pandemic is an endurance race. Um, we have to be very flexible with, you know, how we reopen and how we close again. And I think many, many countries in the world have been able to do this. In my opinion, the U.S. is very much lagging behind. Um, but hopefully we will all. And the problem is, is that we are a global society. Um, and so if other countries are having a struggle, it just means that the world progresses to of, you know, un being completely reopened a lot slower. Um, and we want to be able to go back to classical music concerts. We want to be able to, you know, see our friends. Once I graduate from graduate school, I would love to take a trip to Europe and, you know, see the world. Um, but we can't do that until, you know, we all come together. So, this is kind of my last point, and then I will open up the chat for, let's say, like 10 minutes of questions, and then y'all can go back to practicing um, 
Oh my gosh, he even changed the title to Mole Cats. It's funny. Um, all right, so what can we do now? Um, so if you had a ticket to, um, you know, see your orchestra, go see Ray, what have you, um, you can do donate your ticket to the orchestra. I mean, yeah, the ticket prices are expensive, but remember, people aren't at work right now. Um, and that money can really help um, the not just the orchestra, but also the venue and the people who work to maintain the venue keep their jobs. Um, you can also donate to your local artist relief fund. In Chicago, we have an artist relief fund. Um, other areas do as well. I am a Nitro user. Um, Nitro, I think is like 10 bucks a month. So if you're like, hey, I don't have cash, but I'm a Nitro user, you don't have to do Nitro for a month. Don't worry, we'll, Ray will be fine. Like we've got him covered. Um, you can take that one month and donate it to your local um, artist relief fund and they will greatly appreciate it. Never Nadia. Um, so uh, that's another way. And remember, it's not just classical musicians, Broadway, um, theater, um, you know, art galleries, what have you, things that we would all come together and collectively share the experience. We're not, we can't do this anymore. Um, the other uh, things that you can do is continue to show your support. And Ray is in here, but um, you can continue to show your support for this uh, social media uh, content on Ray's social media on YouTube by liking, subscribing, and commenting on his YouTube videos or any other classical artists that you see on uh, social media. Um, you can, you know, continue to spread the word to your friends. Um, I <laughs> finally told my, I was telling my friend who just started violin in September and she was like, oh, wow, you know, this is really, really cool. How can I, you know, get involved more? But she's, she's currently experiencing like this big lull in practicing. I was like, yo, you should really try this. Um, she can't do Discord. She's a bigger boomer than I am, but she is watching, like she did subscribe to Ray's YouTube channel and I was like, yay, you did it. Um, so I was really proud. Um, so then, um, the other things that you can do, um, and this is like the simplest thing that you can do, just wear your mask. Like wearing your mask is like this, literally you just put on your mask and you go outside. Some areas do make this a mandate and this is where I have to, you know, be the responsible researcher and tell everyone, please make sure that you you know, follow all of your regional guidelines as to how to manage COVID-19, um, you know, whatever your regional guidelines may be. Um, but remember, if you, and I'm really speaking to those in the U.S., um, if you wear your mask, it's not only respect to, you know, yourself and your neighbors and everyone around you, but it's also respect for people who are currently out of work. Um, and we can get them back to what they're good at as quickly as possible. So again, these are very simple things that anyone in this Discord can do. Donate your tickets if you bought tickets. Um, you know, donate to your local artist relief fund. Like 10 bucks actually goes a really long way. Um, and any little bit helps. Um, remember to like, subscribe, and comment on social media of your favorite classical musicians. You know, Ray tells us all the time, but I'll plug it again because he is hosting this podcast. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Um, and uh, make sure you wear your mask. That's literally the bare minimum that you have to do. Um, and then finally, when we finally get through this pandemic, which it will come, we make it sound like we'll be stuck in here forever. Like there will be a time that we are post COVID-19. Um, make it a point to go to a concert. Like I've told a few of you here on the Discord that, you know, and as some of you may know, I am a minority. There's not really a big presence of minorities at classical music concerts. Um, actually, I was reading someone's like social media post that they went to uh, Shiku uh, Mason's concert. He's a famous cellist um, in the UK and he is also a minority and just, amazing fantastic 
Um, but one of the concert goers actually like asked the person like, why are there so many minorities at this classical music concert? And they're like, oh, it's because she can play. And I was like, really? Bruh. Like it just, ah, it just put, made me shiver. I was like, ugh. But, and that's probably one of the reasons why I really only felt comfortable before going to my university because at the university, it's just like a bunch of, you know, 18 to 22 year olds and it's okay for me to show up in jeans and because everyone knows like you're just a part of the university and my university has been phenomenal giving us amazing performances um james ends uh dover quartet um there's probably like a couple other ones those are the only two that are literally like coming to mind because james ends got like eaten by our concert hall like concert hall was just like this man we're just gonna end his whole career and the sound was just destroyed um dover quartet though um the first violinist joel his violin just dominated our concert hall so sometimes we all like put bets like huh i wonder how i wonder how this violinist will deal with our concert hall yeah yeah exactly um so uh but i did uh make a challenge to myself that post covid19 uh ray did announce that he was possibly going to be playing with the new york phil um and i have not had a vacation in seven years um so my plan is is like when we get done with covid19 i'm going to new york i'm gonna go see a nice concert and eat some good food um yeah <laughs> um so that is my goal and i think that should be everyone else's goal too um because they need our help and even though like i'm an amateur violinist i'm a scientist um you know Classical music has really gotten me through, um, you know, some of the tougher moments of my life being in grad school and just in life in general. And it's important to give back. Um, great. Um, so with that, um, I will now <laughs> open the chat very quickly with uh, questions that you guys may have. And you can use questions. So use this if you have a question for me um <laughs> and i will try to answer it some of them i may not be able to answer because i don't have the research on me right now all right so first question from matt's how do you think orchestras and bands will work within high schools i know it's a change for professional life but do you think schools may just disband them completely for the year um that is a really good question and it's really dependent on the space and the resources that each high school has to work with. Because you can imagine that, again, depending on what region of the country that you are or what region of the world that you are, um, if you, I'm, I'm just gonna use Chicago as an example, Chicago will have nice weather until October 31st and we will be officially back into snow. Um, so if that's the case, then it'll be really hard to maintain social distancing if um, you know, everyone's stuck in a small space and high schools do not have the resources to make sure students are safe. In fact, right now, there's a very big debate going on in the U.S. whether or not schools should be back in session at all. Um, and I know that the resources for some schools just aren't there. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. Personally, I don't think that many schools will be able to have band rehearsal per the norm. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, all right. So next question. What is our current knowledge on the prevalence of aerosol transmission versus droplet? Um, <laughs> not much, unfortunately. Um, aerosol transmission is just getting started. And when I say just getting started, maybe like a week or two ago. Um, so we know that droplet formation has been, it's been known for at least April. Um, so we've known about this for at least a couple months, but aerosol transmission, um, is just getting like, the research is just coming in. Um, scientists have been telling, you know, WHO that aerosol transmission seems to be a very important way of virus transmission. Um, and there's still a lot of conversation and, and debate as to classifying how this virus does get transmitted. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, question from all. 
Uh, from Nadia, how likely is there that there will be a second wave of COVID-19 and when do you think it will hit us? That is a really good question, Nadia. So it depends on where in the world you are. Most places in Europe and Asia um, are actually, they're in uh, a state where um, they don't have a lot of COVID-19 cases. Um, the U.S. is still in its first wave. Um, so if you're a U.S. listener, disregard what I'm currently saying. If you are not a U.S. listener, um, the possibility of having a second wave of COVID is really dependent on, because right now in the Northern Hemisphere, it is summertime. So a lot of people are outside um, and aerosol droplet formation has a lot more surface area. So the potential of getting a high dose of virus is a lot lower. Um, if we would get a second wave, and again, it's dependent on people following their region guidelines um, and making sure that we're very vigilant, um, there could be a possibility because on top of having COVID, we would also be starting flu season. So flu season usually starts up around September and it runs until May. Um, so there could be a possibility that um, the if there would be a second wave, it may coincide with uh, influenza uh, season. So we just have to wait and see. For the U.S., we are currently still in our first wave. Um, and <laughs> hopefully we can get out of this first wave, but it really is dependent on constant vigilance from, uh, uh, from Americans. So, uh, all right. Uh, so, oh, all right. Question from all, uh, what are some options for universities to reopen for class? Um, right now, um, especially for music majors right now, we are feeling really unmotivated to return to school because how are we supposed to learn practical music skills? Um, for example, I have clinical improv as a class, but it's online and this is from Jess. Um, so, uh, right now, and I can only tell you what my university is up to and a couple other universities in the Chicago area are up to, um, we are not allowed, um, so we are only allowed to have 25 people up on stage. No brass, no winds, no singers. If you are a string player, um, you must be masked and you must bring your own chair and your own stand to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19. Um, so as far as my orchestra is concerned, we decided that we were completely going virtual because it wasn't fair to those who wanted to play um, but couldn't because they were a flute player or an oboe player like we do not discriminate um so a lot of universities right now are doing either online learning or a hybrid of learning but again following social distancing guidelines um in the u.s i am not sure of what universities outside of the u.s are doing um we've just been paying attention to it because we're um, supposed to be getting an influx of more people on campus and we're a little concerned at the moment. Um, if you're feeling really unmotivated because, you know, how are you supposed to learn these practical practical music music skills? Um, you know, it's it it really comes to thinking outside of the box. Um, and it's a really crap answer because like right now I'm thinking, how am I supposed to like present in front of people because you know as a scientist like you know we're supposed to be able to communicate our research how are we supposed to you know learn how to like how am I supposed to learn how to play violin like half the time I'm like are my fingers in the right place I don't know this sounds like crap um but you know it's it, it's not it, it's really tough it's really really tough Jess like I I definitely feel you because they're like, how are we supposed to train undergrads to do lab skills? Like they're not going to do chem lab at home. I don't want an undergrad pulling out hydrochloric acid in their house. <laughs> They'll light their house on fire. Um, so we're just trying as best as we can. We know it's not like the ideal solution. Um, but, you know, at least for labs, we've done a lot of things that their skills that are transferable. So like, a lot of quantitative skills, a lot of bioinformatics. Um, and unfortunately, like with improv, um, I, so I'm going to do another quick plug. Go Go is currently doing this improv on piano and it's freaking amazing. 
um, networking is also like a really, you know, something that you could do to ask people if they're also like doing improv. Oh, clinical improv. I don't even know what that is. I can't even read. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Now I'm starting to get hungry. I know how this feels now. Um, but I did eat beforehand. So my hunger is not like desperate hunger. So unfortunately, Jess, I don't have the best response for you um, because I only know what the U.S. is doing. Um, but um, and I really feel for you not being motivated. Um, but hopefully, you know, the community, we do have an amazing Discord community and hopefully someone can reach out and give you some, ama some amazing ideas. <clears throat> let's see. Um, so another question, um, let's see, it's 211. So let's keep it at like four, three or four more questions. Um, and then I will, uh, cut the we'll we'll wrap up the podcast so annie has a question from the current research i've read up on it seems like the natural immunity after a past infection does not play a significant role in fighting the spread of virus since you can catch the virus again pretty soon after you've recovered how does a vaccine provide permanent or significantly longer immunity even if if not even the actual virus can grant that so that's a really great question annie so currently what we are and this is what we've been kind of waiting on is to understand how the natural immune system works um what we know so far and the research is still ongoing is there's really two camps of immunity there's the group that are the asymptomatic spreaders where they have T cells that have account encountered a coronavirus that is similar, but not COVID-19 and can um, bind to the virus, but not provide um, a large enough immune response to clear the virus. So it binds, but not all the virus is cleared. Um, and that's why you can have an asymptomatic spreader um, because you don't generate enough of an immune response to fight the virus, but the virus can still um, propagate in um, that individual. And then you have a second immune, a second individual that um, encounters the virus, has some sort of reaction to it, symptoms, fever, um, cough, what have you. Um, and their immune response seems to last for up to through two to three months, according to the research, with like high levels of, um, uh, of cytokines, which are the primary proteins that are involved um, with it, uh, inflammation and T cells and B cells, which are the primary cells that are involved with um, uh, generating immunity. So what a vaccine can do is it will, our goal is, is that we want to have a vaccine that can provide longer immunity, similar to something like the flu vaccine. Because a flu vaccine, yes, some flus, you can, you'll be challenged with the flu and then you'll have permanent immunity. But other flus, you don't achieve permanent immunity. You only achieve a longer immunity. And usually that's like up to a year, usually like nine months. Of, of immunity. If we can grant nine months of immunity versus two months of immunity, um, that means that we could get um, the economy and people back into work and people just have to, you know, uh, be up to date with their vaccines, which already is enough of a problem. Like, how are we going to, I can barely like remember to buy milk. How am I going to like remember to get this vaccine? So there's just a lot that we have to go into planning. But on the science end, the goal is to develop a vaccine that is easily um, disseminated within the community that can provide at least a year of immunity. But because we're already seeing, and Part of this issue, Annie, of the reason why the, um, the natural immunity is not playing a significant role is that COVID-19 went through an additional mutation. So the virus has already mutated into a shape that you don't know which version you're getting. Um, so that could also be uh, one of the reasons uh, that we're seeing this uh, reduced um, uh natural immunity and you know we'll just have to wait and see what the what the numbers show um all right so this is from gogo um 
how have the models that have been created for the spread of COVID-19 influenced your current research on the subject? Models can differ quite a lot. How do you choose which data to follow? That's a really great question. Um, and I think because the community has decided to put aside their you know, differences and really become more collaborative, it's allowed for research to be shared a lot more quickly, but it also requires everybody to verify the research that they're looking at before moving forward. Um, the research that my lab particularly uses, because we are interested in the hours and like up to two days after you after your challenge with the virus, that's what we care about. Um, we really focus on that. So we, but we also look at the rest of the data as well because it's it's about you know it's cohesiveness. We want to see how our piece of the um, research story fits in with the entirety of you know immunity in general. Um, so again, it, and it's kind of what my boss always says: trust but verify. So we trust the data that we see, but we verify it for ourselves. Um, so hopefully that is a, an adequate, um, response. Um, oh, Clarinette, this is a really great question. Um, how can random people like myself, um, you're not random first off, you're a loving citizen of our Discord community, um, help towards COVID-19 as well as taking precautions. I really want to help more, but I'm not a scientist and don't work with, um, nurses and doctors through, um, NHS. Um, a really, the, so the first thing you can do is spread the word to your loved ones to make sure that they wear masks. Um, in the U.S., there are organizations like the American Red Cross that you can donate money to so we can help, you know, um, get more supplies. But the really big thing is just making sure that first off, you wear a mask, you wash your hands, limit the amount of time that you go outdoors or you're with uh, groups of people. Um, because again, the same rules that we had at the beginning of quarantine still apply. The less that you can go outside, the better. Um, and I think just making sure that you watch what kind of information that you are uh, feeding yourself, you know, making sure that the data that you're receiving is peer reviewed, or if it's not peer reviewed, to make sure that you keep that in mind as new data comes into play. Um, so, uh, that's a couple reasons, that, uh, suggestions that you can do. Um, all right. So with that, it's already 2.18 my time, 3.18 Eastern Standard Time. Um, my voice is already starting to go. Um, and uh, thank you guys so much um, for tuning in to this MOLCast. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and thank you guys so much for the questions. Again, if you're interested in, um, you know, learning more about this, learning, you know, discussing um, more about science and research in general, please join our science server. Um, and the next uh, MOLCast, uh, I usually, <laughs> I usually, I would like, I usually like to have like every other week because I, I am busy. Um, so hopefully this next podcast will be on August 2nd. Um, and yeah, I announced MOLCast on my server. I will be much better about it. I promise Justina, I will be much better about it. Um, and I will have the topic and the um, date and time um, because it's not always going to be at 2, p at, um, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, the times may change. Um, so that way, you know, more people can join in either from, you know, Asia gang or uh, EU gang. Um, oh, thank you so much, Justina. Um, you're, you're amazing. No, you. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, the times may not, the times may change, but it will usually be on a Sunday. Um, it's just, uh, and the podcast will be here. Molecast will always be here on the Ray Chen violin server, unless Ray Chen says otherwise. <laughs> um, the recordings, uh, once I check and see, uh, how the recording worked on my phone, uh, I will work with Justina and we'll figure out how we can put it on the science server. Um, <laughs> Annie. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Thank you, server mom. Um, I will put it on the, we will put it on the sign on the podcast, the podcast on the science server. Um,
for anyone who's interested in listening. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Oh, almost forgot. If you have any ideas for future mole casts, I have a couple, um, but I'm always interested in finding out new stuff from you. Um, remember the theme that I'm really trying to go for is something that we all can enjoy. Um, that's relating science, music, or things like one, a future episode will be science and sleep because we have trouble sleeping on this server. Um, and we also have trouble eating on this server and maintaining good meals. Um, so that's a couple of the future episodes that are coming up. Um, (laughs) I have trouble sleeping too, guys. I have trouble sleeping too. I'm calling myself out We're we're going to be educated together. We're going to, we're going to be better. Um, and hopefully we'll get some neuroscience in here. Um, maybe some social sciences, um, love to do an episode on just general laugh therapy in general. Um, so yeah. Uh, but again, if you have any other ideas and you're like, well, we need to do, you know, this episode, um, Definitely, um, we can chat about it and we can look into doing something like that in the future. So um, with that, thank you guys so much. Um, This has been a lot of fun um, and I will hopefully see you guys um, in the chat in... (laughs) I'm just reading Gogo's comment, 1.5 hours of mole laugh. (laughs) That's a lot of laugh. Um, Yeah, I will see you guys in main general science server around Discord. So. Thank you guys so, so much. And with that, bye.